1692, 20 people were executed as witches. 19 of them were hanged. But it wasn't the kind of hanging where their necks snapped instantly and they died quickly. The drop was short, which means that they slowly suffocated in the hangman's noose. Witch persecution was not new in the late 17th century, that's the 1600s. Witchcraft has been around for ages, and the first witch hunts took place in the late 14th century or 1300s. Yet, of all of the witch hunts in history, the Salem witch trials are the most infamous, perhaps seconded by the Pendle witch trials in 1612 in England. I just did an episode on that last week. So what is it about this particular event that makes people so curious? Why are we so fascinated by Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, and its several movie adaptations? Why do millennials like me love Hocus Pocus and Practical Magic and The Craft? And don't even get me started on shows like Charmed or Sabrina the Teenage Witch, right? But there is something peculiar about Salem, something that draws us in. You could say it's cast a spell on us historians ever since 1692. We're a group obsessed. Salem has become one of the most popular events in American history, but I'm curious to find out why. What is it about Salem, Massachusetts that brings in almost one million visitors every year? To find out, we're going to do the history of the Salem Witch Trials together. First, we'll take a look at the event in question, focusing on all the gory details, of course, but then we'll take a look at the context. You know me, I love my context. Historical context is the most important part of history, at least in my opinion. It's finding out why something happened at that particular moment in time. So why 1692 and why Salem and why the Puritans? To answer this, we need to understand the 17th century world that these people lived in because it is so different from our 21st century one. Salem Village was a frontier settlement, a small outpost of Puritans that more or less governed themselves. They fought against the indigenous who lived in Maine. They shivered in the bitter New England cold. They suffered from failing crops, and they struggled against sins and demons. And into this harsh world in 1692, a handful of girls started to accuse first women and later men, of witchcraft. Why they did this is purely speculative, but let's do the history to figure out what might have caused the Salem Witch Trials. So let's get started. Pumpkin spice coffee. It's January 1692. The Reverend Paris thinks his daughter Betty and niece Abigail Williams are acting strangely. By February, he thinks that they are afflicted. The girls writhed around on the floor, screaming, crying out in pain, their bodies contorted in unnatural positions, and word soon spread throughout Salem and other nearby towns that something strange was happening in the Reverend's home. Soon after, other girls in Salem Village became afflicted, and one of them was Anne Putnam Jr., daughter of the prominent Joseph Putnam. The community, under Reverend Paris, clamored for answers. What was afflicting these girls? Why was their community suffering? To many, there was only one answer to those questions. Witchcraft. It was a fear that Puritans had brought over from England, where there had been other high-profile witch trials, like the 1612 Pendle witch trials. Go check out that episode when you're done here, if you haven't already. Before long, Reverend Paris forced the girls to point out who among them was causing these afflictions. Betty Paris calls out her family servant, Tituba, and shortly after, Anne Jr. and another girl calls out a Sarah Good and a Sarah Osborne, and these three women were the first to be condemned. When we look at the traditional European depiction of witches, we see similarities to Tituba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne. Poor, marginalized women who existed outside the norms of society. And for Salem in 1692, that meant Puritan society. The Puritan movement grew as a subset of the Church of England in the 16th century. They felt that the Church of England was engaging in ceremonies and practices that were too similar to Catholicism, which, you know, the Church of England left Catholicism for a reason, right? So the Puritans left England for the Americas so they could practice their religion without temptation or evil surrounding them, which they thought they were getting in England. 
The larger context here, of course, involves the Protestant Reformation in Europe in the 16th century, where the Christian church split into the Catholic and Protestant faiths. It was a tumultuous period where different ideas about the Bible and salvation emerged, and religious conflict soon followed. But you've heard me ramble on enough about the Protestant Reformation in a lot of episodes by this point, so I'm not going to do it again here. Eager to escape all of this chaos, the Puritans left for New England. But Puritan life in New England was hard, and now suddenly the people of Salem felt Satan himself was attacking them with the emergence of witchcraft in their community. When put on trial, Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne denied being witches, because, you know, they, they weren't witches. Sarah Good was an impoverished widow forced to beg the community for handouts, and the others looked at her as this angry, ungrateful woman, but in reality, she was just a woman living on the fringes of a strict and harsh puritanical society. Sarah Osborne was practically bedridden, actually, at the time of the trials, but had previously been scandalized when she married an indentured servant. And the two, Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne, fit that classic stereotype of being on the outside. Outcasts, unliked by many, misunderstood by most. Tichuba, though, unlike Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne, Tichuba admitted to practicing witchcraft. She went so far as to say that Sarah Good and Osborne were tormenting her and that the three of them together had signed the devil's book with their blood in the reverend's house as he slept. She also claimed that there were at least nine other witches in Salem. Why? <laughs> Why she said these things, we'll never know. But... Tichuba gave, the court, Tichuba gave the court what they wanted, and the witch hunts began. The afflicted girls continued to give names, including Sarah Good's four-year-old daughter. I'm not even going to get started on that one. They also named two elderly church-going ladies, Martha Corey and Rebecca Nurse. And suddenly, it wasn't just the outcasts of puritanical society labeled as witches, but good, devout Puritan women. And then, it wasn't just the women. John Proctor, another prominent member of the Salem community, was accused by his servant, Mary Warren. Following him, Bridget Bishop was called, and then Giles Corey, husband of the previously accused Martha Corey, and the list continued on and on and on. Accusations now spread beyond Salem. A Puritan reverend from Maine, George Burroughs, was accused along with four other women from Woburn, Massachusetts. The jail cells at Salem grew cramped and fetid as the accused were forced to sit in their own filth until their court hearings. The first to die was Sarah Osborne. Already in poor health from the beginning, she died in prison awaiting her trial. By May, just four months after Paris's daughter and niece first showed signs of possession, over 40 people had been accused of witchcraft, with more and more adding to that list every day. The first witchcraft trial took place on June 2nd, 1692, and though she wasn't the first accused, Bridget Bishop was the first to plead her case. She fit the bill of the traditional witch. She was elderly, poor, difficult, suspicious of others. Ten people came out to testify against her, and though they were mostly basis, baseless accusations, the court found her guilty anyway, and she was hanged to death eight days later. Bridget's death was the first of 19 hangings that took place in 1692, and shortly after Bridget's ordeal, more women were put on trial. The afflicted girls said that Sarah Good haunted them with her specter at night. They said she had familiars, which are supernatural entities that take the form of animals to help a witch do her bidding. Or his bidding. There can be male witches. More and more people were brought on trial and then hanged. But with Rebecca Nurse's execution, things started to change. A second phase in the trials, if you will. People looked down on Tichuba, Sarah Good, and Sarah Osborne, and Bridget Bishop as women who could potentially be witches because they were different in some way. Outsiders, for a variety of reasons. They fit the descriptions of witches that they had heard and read about or listened to in the sermons from their preacher, from their reverend. 
They certainly weren't seen as devout Puritan women, free from sin. But to many in Salem, Rebecca Nurse was free from sin. She was a devout Puritan woman. She was the most devout of them all, in fact. She was a woman in her 70s who served the community for her entire life. She was filled with goodness and piousness. She had a spotless reputation. But when her name was called and when she was convicted by the court, it showed Salem that nobody was safe. Rebecca Nurse, along with Sarah Good and three other women, was hanged on July 19th. Soon after, the court started to use torture to get confessions out of the accused. One method was being tied neck to heels, where the person was bent backwards in, it, it reminds me a bit of like the arrow pose in yoga, or the bow pose in yoga. The person was bent backwards so that their heels met the back of their neck. Few people are flexible enough to withstand this for more than a few minutes, let alone indefinitely. And those tortured this way were left until they bled from their nose and mouths. Gross. I don't want blood coming out of my nose and mouth. More and more people were accused, and at the same time, the court was preparing for more hangings. On August 19th, five more were hanged, but this time, four men were among them. One man, Giles Corey, was arrested on suspicion of witchcraft because his wife had been previously accused. Giles Corey refused to plea before the court, though, calling out the spectacle for what it was. Just complete nonsense. To torture him into submission, he was pressed. Being pressed is when a victim is placed on a wooden board, hands restrained to the sides in a T-pose, and then another board is placed on top and heavy stones laid upon it until the person is essentially squished to death. And I am not ashamed to admit, by the way, that I thought this was what stoning was for the longest time. It wasn't until I read the lottery in high school, probably junior year with Miss Puma, but definitely in high school, that I learned that stoning is throwing stones at somebody until they die of blunt trauma and internal bleeding. So, see? Learn something new every day. Giles Corey refused to plead guilty or innocent, despite being pressed for three days with heavier and heavier stones each time. The court could not abide by his stubbornness, so they added more stones on top of him, and his last words were, more weight before succumbing to his internal injuries. Keep in mind, Giles Corey was an innocent man, as all of these accused witches were, but the court just tortured him to death. So how far is too far? How would people in Salem react to this? Surely this was what the Puritans believed God wanted from them, right? To just kill people on baseless accusations? And by the way, Giles Corey's death is the only example of pressing as a form of torture or death sanctioned in American history. Yikes. Three days after Giles Corey's death, or I guess we can just call it murder at this point, eight more were hanged, including his wife, Martha. These were the last accused witches to be hanged. There was growing opposition, <laughs> so... Especially after Rebecca Nurse's death, people were starting to question things. When someone as pious as Rebecca Nurse can be killed, then anybody can be killed, right? They were starting to see, at least the people in Salem, the tide was turning a little bit, and they were starting to see the accused as actually innocent. The trials were becoming more and more rushed, the evidence less and less convincing. People grew disgusted at the torture and what happened to the elderly Giles Corey. He was 81 years old, by the way, when he was pressed to death. And people also started to think, if the Puritans were truly doing God's work in purging wickedness from Salem, then shouldn't life in Salem be getting better? They thought that they were removing the devil from their community, but things only got worse for New England. In July of 1692, a large fire broke out in Boston, and then drought and mass crop failure followed, and even a Puritan settlement in Jamaica was leveled by an earthquake. English cities were in trouble, and Puritans began to doubt whether they were doing the right thing by killing these accused witches. But meanwhile, the witchcraft accusations spread to neighboring Andover, then to Gloucester, and then onwards throughout Massachusetts and Connecticut and the South and Maine and the North. 
A man named William Phipps was appointed to the Massachusetts Bay Colony in this time. He was made the governor in the midst of all of this nonsense, and he quickly put a stop to the madness. He forbade any more charges except under extreme circumstances, especially since his own wife was accused, and she had never even set foot in Salem. By now, a majority of the town was against the trials, and the girls who claimed they were afflicted were losing their power over the crowd. Curiously, Tichuba was one of the last to stand trial. The Salem court had focused much of its time on those who pled not guilty. Those who confessed to witchcraft, like Tichuba, were left to rot in prison while the court prosecuted those who claimed innocence. But with Governor Phipps, the madness in Salem stopped, and she was eventually acquitted, along with many others who were accused of witchcraft or had confessed to being a witch. There would be no more deaths by hanging in Salem. The last to die on the gallows died in September with Martha Corey, nine months after the whole ordeal began. Two other women died in prison awaiting their freedoms, and the last one passed away on March 10, 1693. In all, more than 200 people were accused of practicing witchcraft, 19 were hanged, one was pressed to death, and three died in jail. So what went wrong here? I have so many questions, and I hope you do too. Why were these girls, and even some women, accusing others of being witches? Did they truly believe that, or were they faking it? The girls exhibited symptoms of possession, which mirrored prior cases, so how did they know how to act, afflicted, if they were just faking it? And why did Tichuba confess to being a witch and tell the court blatant lies? Why did others confess too if they had never practiced witchcraft? How did the court decide which ones should hang and which should stay in jail? Why did it spread so quickly from Salem to other areas? Why were so many people accused? How did they prove witchcraft in court? And was there any way to prove innocence or just guilt? And above all, the main question, right? Why Salem? What went terribly, terribly wrong here? To fully understand this event, we need to do our history and look into the context. Salem was a community racked by fear, and we can't do this story justice without looking into its past and piecing together the evidence best we can to explain why the Salem witch trials happened. First, I want to explore what was wrong with these afflicted girls. Was there something medically or supernaturally wrong with them to make them act possessed? Historians over the years have put forth many explanations for what was happening to these girls. Here are some of the more interesting claims. In 1976, Dr. Linda Caporell put forth the idea that the girls were suffering from a hallucinogenic fungus known as rye ergot. It grows on rye when there is a cold winter and a wet spring. People suffering from convulsive ergotism suffer from paranoia, hallucinations, twitches, spasms, and more. It might explain why the girls were acting possessed, but if that were the case, then everyone in the community would be affected, right? Not just the girls. Rye is a cereal grain, right? The Puritans certainly relied on growing rye to survive in the harsh winters, and they would have consumed a lot of it. But if their crop was tainted by ergot spores, the whole community would have been sick, not just a handful of girls. There were also other symptoms of convulsive ergotism that they didn't have, like vomiting, diarrhea, gangrene, even dementia. So I think we can rule that one out. In 1999, Lori Wynn Carlson claims that the girls were suffering from encephalitis lethargica, but that's primarily a mosquito-borne disease, and it would have been too cold in New England for that to functionally spread around so quickly. In 2008, Mary Dryman proposed in her book, Disguised as the Devil, that it could have been Lyme disease, which if you live in New England, you know, or the U.S., you know, you can get from a tick. One of the classic symptoms of Lyme disease is a rash with a red ring around it. And if you ever see one of those on your body, by the way, go see a doctor ASAP. And if you've got a tick on you, try to remove the tick whole and save it in a little plastic baggie and bring it in so they can do testing on it. Just putting it out there. But Dryman theorized that perhaps the witches were suffering from Lyme disease, which might help explain why they were acting strangely and had what was known as witches' teats. Okay, so get this. A witch's teat, or a devil mark, was thought to be what was left behind when the witches uh, fed the devil. Hence, teat. 
They believed that the devil suckled on the witch's flesh and a red mark or bump was left behind, and it could be anywhere on the body. Now, when Bridget Bishop was first on trial, the first witch tried and hanged, right? The court forced this poor woman to strip naked in front of nine other women and a male surgeon. They were looking for evidence of possession through a witch's teat on her body, and they found one. And there's no pleasant way to say where they found it, so I'll just say it was on her lady bits. The court thought that this was proof that she signed the devil's book and practiced witchcraft. And this, coupled with the accusations against her, led the court to quickly find her guilty. So Dryman thinks that perhaps these red bumps were symptoms of Lyme disease and not satanic possession. However, this doesn't explain why innocent people were calling out other innocent people in Salem, and it was likely too cold in New England for the ticks anyway, for all of the women that they considered to be witches, right? And men. At least in the colder months. Maybe in the summer. Not so much in January and February. And speaking of Bridget Bishop, by the way, some of the men in Salem Village testified that her specter, her ghost, right, would appear to them in the night, sit on her chest, and choke them. Some historians have attributed this to sleep paralysis, where victims can see and hear, but they can't move. And many who suffer from sleep paralysis complain of weight on their chest, a choking sensation, and the feeling like they're under attack. This matches some of the descriptions of the afflicted, but it's strange to think that several members of the community were all suffering from sleep paralysis at the same time, and all had sleep paralysis demons that were basically Bridget Bishop. Bridget Bishop. That's too convenient, right? Hypothermia was also brought up as a potential reason for the afflicted girl's behavior. Hypothermia, as a quick reminder, is when your body drops its core temperature below homeostasis, the level it needs to be at for everything to work properly in your body, right? And your brain starts to do weird things. Perhaps in 1692, when the winter was the coldest it had been for a very long time, maybe people were suffering from hypothermia. But at the end of the day, as historian Ted Baker put in his book, A Storm of Witchcraft, great book by the way, we're using 21st century perspectives to explain a 17th century phenomenon. Salem residents in 1692 had their own explanation for what was happening. Witchcraft. It was something they all believed in and they all feared. Since they all believed in the existence of God, they also believed in the existence of the devil. And the devil was always trying to tempt them towards evil. The primary way he did that was through witchcraft. Here's a passage from Chris Bojalian's historical, fixture, uh, historical fiction, Hour of the Witch. Excellent book, by the way, highly recommended. It takes place 30 years before Salem, but it also uses the themes of the devil and witchcraft to tell a story about a woman trapped because of her gender in Puritan New England. Bojalian does a really good job encapsulating how the Puritans felt about God, the devil, and sin. Quote, but God is mindful of their wickedness. Men who crave darkness are the objects of a wrath that no mortal mind can imagine. They see their skin seared from their arms and their bones blackened. They will watch the flames turn their legs to charred logs and their feet to ash. And they will see it and feel it every day for eternity. Every single day, every minute and every hour, their eyelids burned away so they cannot close them to their deformity and torture and shame. Yes, shame. The shame of the sinner, the worst shame there can be. They will live always with the smell of burnt hair and burnt flesh, with flames on their skin that cannot be smothered by their sweat or their humors, or even an ocean as wide as the one that separates our world from the one we left. But their eyes will never melt. Not first, not last, not ever. So they can see always what Satan can and what Satan will do. Their screams will be shrieks that will make thunder quail. This will be our condemnation too, if we do not strive with greater zeal to live the life that God wants for us. End quote. Powerful stuff there. And if this is truly what the Puritans believed, then no wonder they were also scared of the devil in witchcraft. So the real question then is, how do we detect witchcraft, and were the accusers faking their afflictions? Let's look at one of the accusers in detail to get a better understanding of what happened here. Mary Warren was a 20-year-old servant who worked for John and Elizabeth Proctor. Like Betty Paris and Ann Putnam Jr., Mary Warren started to show signs of affliction, claiming that Martha Corey's specter was haunting her. 
John Proctor was a vocal critic of these trials and threatened to beat Mary Warren when she started acting that way. And magically, Mary Warren got better. Warren essentially recants and says that the other girls are lying about being possessed by witches. And the other afflicted girls took this as a threat against whatever it is that they were doing. So the girls then turned on her and said that Mary Warren was a witch. Can you believe it? They turned on her just to protect themselves. So to save her own skin, because accusations are just flying at this point, she accuses her masters, Elizabeth and John Proctor, of witchcraft. And thus, Mary Warren took the heat off of her by blaming somebody else. This is part of the reason why witchcraft accusations spread so rapidly in Salem. One could save themselves by blaming another. It was a feedback loop. And so this system of blaming your neighbors spiraled out of control. I accuse Goody Flanders. <gasps> I accuse Goody Badwife. Uh, we killed her on Sunday. Well, there must be someone here we can accuse. Lisa Simpson. Bart, quit it. She put a spell on me. If you were accused and you confessed, you were spared a hanging because you confessed, but you had to point the finger at somebody else who turned you into a witch. So it led to an outbreak of accusations and just straight madness, frankly. Witches were convicted in two primary ways. First, the witch confessed. And second, there were eyewitnesses to the accused witch practicing black magic. And these make sense, I guess. But most of the convictions in Salem were done with really dubious measures, really dubious evidence. And the most prominent of those was the use of spectral evidence. Spectral evidence was witness testimony that the accused spirit came to them in the night and tormented them. Hopefully you see the glaring problem with this as evidence in a court of law. Like, how, how do you even prove something like that happened? These mainly teenage girls were just saying that another person's specter was haunting them, and the court believed them. Just like, oh, well, she said it, so I guess it happened. But it's dubious evidence to use for a trial, right? And, and then when Governor Phipps, among others, heard that this was being used to convict witches, they quickly disallowed it in court. Another way the Salem court tried witches was through the touch test. If the afflicted girl touched the witch who was tormenting her and the afflictions would stop, that was proof, right? Okay, so suppose I claimed that you were afflicting me. I could tell the court that I saw your spirit attack me in the night. I would rant and rave and contort my body in all kinds of weird ways in your presence in court, right? Screaming that my skin is on fire and felt like there were hands on my throat and all the craziness. So when they had me go and touch you, maybe a hand on the shoulder, right? Magically, my afflictions would stop until we broke contact and then I would start contorting and raving again. I mean, what's there to say? <laughs> this is absolutely ludicrous. It lends itself to the, to the prevailing and most obvious theory here that the girls just made this up. I mean, what kind of proof is that as you're a witch? If I'm totally in control and convulsing and then I touch you and I stop convulsing, that's proof that you're a witch. I... Anyway, the, the girls are faking it. <laughs> the girls are clearly faking it. The evidence used to convict and hang people for this was just completely subjective. And they trusted that these girls saw specters and they trusted their afflictions were real. And as a result, 23 people died. I can think of three basic reasons the supposedly afflicted girls were doing this, and they're not mutually exclusive, by the way. First, they wanted attention. Puritan women, and more specifically Puritan girls, were seen and not heard. Women were thought to be the weaker sex, easily corrupted, and with a penchant towards sinning. In an environment where they were always ignored and belittled, having this kind of power must have felt good. They had the entire town wrapped up in their afflictions, and they had the power to do what they wanted to whomever they wanted. Two, they wanted to rebel against the strict patriarchy and social order of the Puritan world in Massachusetts. Maybe the girls had had enough, and this was their way of reclaiming power. And finally, three, the opposite of what I just said, maybe the girls wanted to save Puritanism, and like the Reverend Paris and other prominent Salem men, they saw Puritanism on the decline, and by purging people that they thought were ruining Puritanism, maybe they thought they were helping? 
But based on what we saw with Mary Warren, where the girls turned on her for threatening to expose their lies, I'm more inclined to believe that the girls were faking it and just liked having the power. But that doesn't answer the bigger question here. Why that particular moment in time? Why the girls of Salem in 1692? There has to be a reason, or several reasons, that explain why the girls acted out and accused their neighbors of witchcraft. That doesn't just happen randomly. History is all about being able to answer that why. So, let's give it a shot. For the F-Out fans out there, isn't it weird to hear the historical context near the end of the episode instead of the beginning? <laughs> These earlier episodes were fun. <laughs> now anyways, Salem was a tense place before Paris's daughter and niece were overcome by fits. It started it all in January 1692, right? The families that lived there squabbled frequently over land, and there emerged two groups. The ones in charge of Salem Village Town Council, led by the Putnams, and the ones who lived closer to the mercantile Salem town by the sea. The original Puritans who came here wanted to live a peaceful farming life, in a place without temptation. But by the late 17th century, the forces of capitalism and global trade had come to New England, and men grew rich off of trade. Some Salemites were among those who got rich this way. But some of the families, like the Putnams, saw this method of making money as a sin. They thought it smacked of pride and greed, and it didn't help that families like the Putnams used to have money and more land in Salem, but had lost it over the years. So they're bitter, right? And these political and economic tensions gave rise to factionalism. Factionalism is where different subgroups will break away from the main group, and in this group of Puritans, some wanted to eschew all things modern, while others wanted to embrace the change that capitalism was bringing to the Northeast. Long story short and simplified, it caused a lot of tension. To make matters worse, in the years leading up to 1692, Salem had gone through three different reverends. It seems like the reverend was being used as a political tool for the old school Puritans to get what they wanted, which was a return to the old days. So when Paris was appointed, he was promised a new home and lots of wood as his salary. He was allied with Thomas Putnam, whose family had been much more prominent in years past. And through the reverend, Putnam hoped to cast out those who were against him and his family. He brought the reverend in, built him a large home, promised him a tax of wood from all of his neighbors, and this, of course, only added fuel to the factionalism fire. In return, the reverend gave fiery sermons about evil and sin, scaring his congregation into thinking that Satan was in their midst. And it wasn't just empty threats. New England was a harsh place in these early days of settlement. In addition to the factionalism present in the village, the people in Salem had to deal with an ongoing war in Maine against the Wabanaki indigenous peoples. Refugees from this conflict, scarred from war and likely suffering from PTSD, came to live in Salem. An orphan named Mar Mercy Short was one of them, and she later became one of the afflicted girls who accused many people of witchcraft. With the ongoing war, and an influx of refugees came an increase in taxes, too. And to deal with this, the Massachusetts Bay Colony tried to print more bills to help, but as we all know, that just causes more inflation. You can't just print money and think you're going to fix things. It make, makes it a lot worse. And as I previously mentioned in 1692, it was in an unusually cold year, so people were suffering from crop failures. That with inflation, high taxes, refugees, trauma, and a war with the Wabanaki made for some very tense times. Puritanism felt under attack, so Reverend Paris made it his mission to bring back old-school Puritan values, which I guess includes hanging innocent people for crimes of witchcraft that they didn't commit, or torturing people to death by pressing them with stones. Another huge issue that plays a part in this story is their charter. Before 1692, the Massachusetts Bay Colony Charter was revoked. This meant that, among other things, they didn't have an official legal system. So what were they to do when Salemites were going on trial for witchcraft? Without a proper system, they created informal ones known as courts of oyer and terminer, which translates to hear and decide. 
The man put in charge of this was William Stoughton, a Puritan hardliner who had little sympathy for the outcasts of Salem, and he was the one who insisted on accepting spectral evidence and a touch test as proof of witchcraft. And the clerk of this court? Thomas Putnam. Now this part is important and relates back to the factionalism that was ripping Salem apart. The other members of the court had family that were part of the accusers. The young girls themselves couldn't formally accuse someone of witchcraft. They were merely the catalyst. Their parents, oftentimes the father, would be the ones who levied the charges. One of the afflicted who did the most accusing? Anne Putnam Jr. Her father, Thomas Putnam, an ally of the Reverend Paris, who wanted to see his opposition crushed, including men like John Proctor, Rebecca Nurse. Rebecca Nurse, you see, was from a family that often squabbled with the Putnams over land and boundary disputes, so it should be no surprise then to hear that the daughter of Thomas Putnam decried her as a witch whose specter was apparently haunting her in the night. So, it seems like we've come to the heart of this then. The factionalism that destroyed Salem was the main reason why accusations were levied against some, but not others. Because none of the Putnams were ever accused of witchcraft, only the outcasts of society or the Putnams' enemies. Or those who dared to speak out against how ludicrous these trials were, like Giles Corey. And because there was no formal legal system or government charter until Governor Phipps arrived on the scene, Stoughton and the other judges were free to run trials how they wanted and execute accused witches in large quantities. The Salem witch trials, in part, was a political thing. So why were the girls ranting and raving, acting possessed? Why were they afflicted, or were they even afflicted? My prevailing theory is that they were stressed out. <laughs> Just stressed out. They lived in a strict Puritan society, one that saw them as weak and sinful, and they were either adjacent to, or lived through, serious trauma and PTSD through King Philip's War. That was the war against the Wabanaki in Maine. Their parents were stressed, engaged in factionalism with their neighbors, right? The reverend was preaching fire and brimstone, which scared them, and it was a combination of factors that led them to break. Perhaps the first few girls did suffer some sort of mental break, and the other girls just followed suit. The first ones to show signs of possession, after all, were the girls living in Reverend Paris's house. It was an incredibly tense time, and perhaps this was their form of release. But at some point, it spun out of control, and when it was over, 23 people were dead. We may never know what actually happened at Salem. We have plenty of documents, accounts, and histories, but there are still a lot of holes in the story. Tituba, for example, who confessed to witchcraft, was never hanged. Those who acquitted, who were acquitted, rather, had to pay fines before they were released from prison, and she was not able to pay that fine, so she just kind of sat in prison for a while, and eventually some family bought her to get her out of prison, and she disappeared from the historical record. So we don't know anything about Tichua and why she confessed to being a witch and said there were witches in Salem. That would be good to know. Many of the afflicted girls were... Well, they just never explained themselves. <laughs> Many married off and left Salem. They disappeared from the historical record. But we did hear from Anne Putnam Jr., one of the chief accusers and daughter of the hardliner, Thomas Putnam. Here's what she read before a pastor and his church congregation at the Salem Village Church in 1706. Quote, I desire to be humbled before God for that sad and humbling providence that befell my father's family in the year about 92. That I, then being in my childhood, should, by such a providence of God, be made an instrument for the accusing of several persons of a grievous crime, whereby their lives were taken away from them, whom, now I have just grounds and good reason to believe, they were innocent persons. And that, and that it was a great delusion of Satan that deceived me in that sad time, whereby I justly fear I have been instrumental, with others, though ignorantly and unwittingly, to bring upon myself and this land the guilt of innocent blood. Though what was said or done by me against any person, I can truly and uprightly say, before God and man, I did it not out of anger, malice, or ill will to any person, for I had no such thing against one of them. But what I did was ignorant, being deluded by Satan. 
and particularly, as I was the chief instrument of accusing Rebecca Nurse and her two sisters, I desired to lie in the dust and to be humble for it, in that I was a cause, with others, of so sad a calamity to them and their families, for which cause I desired to lie in the dust and earnestly beg forgiveness of God, and from all those unto whom I have given just cause of sorrow and offense, whose relations were taken away or accused. End quote. So she was the one deluded by Satan, not the women she accused of signing Satan's book? Ugh, that's annoying. But this is an admission of guilt, right? And it's the closest that we can get to hearing her say that she lied. She's the only one to have apologized for her actions that we know about that exists on the historical record. But when this happened, she was only a child. Her father, Thomas Putnam, was the one actually bringing forth the accusations. A handwriting analyst looked at a lot of the court documents, the depositions describing what the afflicted girls saw, and over 100 of them were written by Thomas Putnam. Over 100. How many of them were altered? Tampered? How many people did he condemn to die because of land disagreement and political factionalism? When we look at this story, we can be shocked at how a bunch of preteen and teenage girls acted in court, whether it was for attention or to please their fathers. But it's important to remember that pulling the strings behind the scenes was the Reverend Samuel Paris and men like Thomas Putnam. Thanks for joining me for today's episode of A Popular History of Unpopular Things. My name is Kelly Beard, and I hope you've enjoyed the story of the Salem Witch Trials. Thank you for supporting my podcast, and if you haven't checked out my other episodes, go have a listen. You can also support me and the show on Patreon. Just look up A Popular History of Unpopular Things and subscribe to F Out on YouTube if you haven't done so already. You should also check out the music that my editor put together, including the intro and outro, Yellow Cake. You can find his stuff wherever you get your music, and links to all of those things are in the description. Be sure to follow my podcast, available wherever you listen, so you know when new episodes are dropped. And stay tuned to get A Popular History of Unpopular Things.